it's accurate like this. I don't know the exact number. It's like 2.316729729 and an uncertainty of 3 at the end. <laughs> this is what you measure in the lab. That's what they calculate. And I say again, we do not know what nature is doing. We have a model of what nature is doing. But we have, we really don't know. People should not have too much hubris about how far we've come. Nonetheless, look at the symmetry of these models. Uh, for example, this is a, a group of mesons structured this way using Murray Gaumann's model for subatomic particles. Now, neutrons. Here's, we've done this before. Here's a neutron decays, uh, one, one down quark becomes an up, and we get proton, electron, and a neutrino. Let's see, I work. Oh, okay, and here for the first time I finally put up the lifetime of a neutron. About 15 minutes. That's the half-life. If you have a bag of neutrons, and you come back 15 minutes later, half the bag will have become protons. But protons are stable for longer than the life of the universe. And I already asked this question. There is no answer. Why is a down in a proton in a nucleus stable for as long as that neutron is in that nucleus? We don't know. Okay, so now we've got enough time to start talking about inflation. So let me remind you that in an early chart, we had a picture of a, like an atomic level. The universe started as like a little nothing and immediately became something huge. This is part of the model built by Alan Guth that's called inflation. There were three problems that emerged in the 1980s related to properties of the universe. I'll describe these to you and how inflation deals with them. There is something called a flatness problem. There is the issue of magnetic monopoles and the issue of uniformity of temperature. So let's go through these. This is a picture of the cosmic microwave background. We've seen this picture before in all those pictures, all those, those uh, cartoons of the expanding universe. You saw a patch of green and yellow and blue mixed together. When we look at the sky in the right wavelengths, in the microwave wavelengths, we see the temperature of the sky. This is a map of the temperature of the sky. It looks like this, uh, just like, let me see if I did this right. Uh, no. It looks like this, just like if you map, uh, take a map of the globe, which is a sphere, and map it in a Mercator projection, you get something that's elliptical in shape. There's the North Pole. There's the South Pole. There's East and West, and they're the same point. So if you travel on this map, if you travel from the equator and go east, to that point, you reappear here. It's a Mercator projection. This map leads to a solution to these three problems. I need to explain to you what those problems are. The colors here indicate the variation in the temperature that we see when we point a sensor at the sky that does not see starlight, it sees microwave radiation. Very much like the microwave radiation that warms up your dinner. This variation looks like there's quite a bit of variation. The colors indicate the difference in temperature if you look to the east and the west and north and south and so forth. And if you do it on a spacecraft that's orbiting, you can look at the entire sphere of light around Earth by rotating the spacecraft, making sure the sun's not in the way, subtracting out the stars in our galaxy, and so forth. And let me tell you how much variation this represents. From the coldest to the warmest, the, the coldest is blue, the warmest is this area here that's red, is a difference of about 15 parts in 100,000. The temperature of the sky is almost completely uniform. 